So welcome back to Drug School and today we're going to be starting the first of three videos that will cover the drug supply chain and inventory life cycle. If you like these videos, please smash the like button and press subscribe. Drug School is a project of the nonprofit West Michigan Pharma or Prescription Assistance Program and you can support our work by making a tax deductible donation using PayPal, link in the description below. In this video, we're going to discuss the main players in the drug supply chain and the relevant regulatory agencies that are involved, as well as the process of drug delivery. The second video is going to discuss the inventory process at the pharmacy, and the third video will address the process of removing excess and expired inventory. If you would like to take notes as we go along, I do have note pages that are available at mydrugschool.com, uh, link in the description below. So let's start at the beginning. The first step in the drug supply chain is pharma. You can see several of them represented here. Um, and in regulatory law, they are collectively known as pharma and they are represented by pharma, P-H-R-M-A, which stands for the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers Association of America. According to statistics, the global supply chain for the pharmaceutical market uh, totaled about $1.48 trillion in the U.S is about one third of that coming in at about $425 billion uh, in 2022. Drug manufacturers take a raw active pharmaceutical ingredient, commonly referred to as an API in the industry, and they turn it into its final dosage form. Capsules, tablets, um, the graphic that you see here um, looks like it might be progesterone capsules. Uh, if I had to venture a guess, it's the only thing I can think of that is pink and round and those suckers just go right around the tray. Uh, in general, pharmacy, pharmacy can compound medication as well using uh, bulk APIs um, and must do so for individual patients unless they are registered with the FDA as an outsourcing facility. Uh, we'll talk about them later. The top three pharmaceutical manufacturers by profit were Novartis, followed by Pfizer, and then Johnson & Johnson, uh, which goes by the name Janssen in terms of prescription drugs. So um, you see a couple of them represented here, um, Pfizer, Johnson, Johnson. Um, pharmaceutical manufacturers are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, otherwise known as the FDA. And it should be noted that many manufacturers have production facilities that are overseas. And even though they are um, in another country, they still must follow all FDA regulations. So for example, uh, Novo Nordisk, which are the makers of many diabetes drugs, has their main manufacturing facilities in Denmark. And even though that they are in Europe, any medications brought into the United States must follow all FDA regulations and adhere to all packaging standards um, when labeling their product for with various tracking numbers. We'll talk about those in our second video because the Drug Supply Chain and uh, Security Act of, uh, gosh, what was that, 2014, <laughs> um, comes into play here. Uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers will often contract out their packaging services, and typically contract packages are used to package drugs into unit dose packages for hospitals, as an example. Uh, you can see an example of that right here in this graphic. Um, to produce generic medications, which is also done quite frequently. You'll see that on a package. Um, when, they, when they put it into a package, it will say something to the effect of um, the, um, uh, the, it is manufactured for a certain drug company and then it is uh, then supplied by or manufactured by a different company. And even though a contract packager is contracted by the pharmaceutical companies, they must follow all FDA regulations. Pharmaceutical manufacturers and drug packagers then sell their products onto wholesalers. And the largest of these wholesalers in the United States are Cardinal Health, McKesson, and Amerisource Bergen. Uh, there are several other smaller ones that pharmacies typically use as uh, smaller secondary wholesalers. Uh, I know when I worked in pharmacy, we had uh, in retail that was uh, many years ago, um, we would have, I think we had four or five different drug wholesalers at the time. And, and we would have to price shop the four or five different drug wholesalers and obtain the lowest price because profit margins are razor thin. So the more you can um, 
mitigate some of that, the better off you are. Uh, drug wholesalers ordered their products in bulk in order to obtain a volume discount on their purchases. Uh, these purchases are then further broken down into cases or individual purchase units. So, um, for example, methadone, uh, just a common pain, uh, pain reliever and drug addiction tool, it comes in cases of 12. You can buy 12 100 count bottles and it would come in a case and that's what you would be distributing them by. Or you can buy 12 individual bottles and there's no discount for either one of those so we just go along with that. In terms of regulation, pharmaceutical or pharmaceutical wholesalers my apologies. Pharmacy wholesalers must not only adhere to FDA regulations in terms of drug storage and drug packaging and drug uh, chain tracking and tracing. Again, we'll get into that in the second video, but they are also required to register with any applicable state boards of pharmacy. So for example, in my last uh, retail pharmacy, um, we used Cardinal Health, Health, bleh, Cardinal Health as its primary wholesaler. And the warehouse was in Aurora, Illinois, and the pharmacy I worked at was in Michigan. So Cardinal actually not only had to register with the Board of Pharmacy in Michigan and Illinois, and since you can't get to Michigan from Illinois without a boat, Indiana also would require registration. And I would imagine that Cardinal probably supplied many of those Indiana pharmacies from their Aurora facility. Because these medications were ordered and shipped across state lines, the federal government oversees the entire shipment through its own regulatory agencies, the FDA and the DEA. Anytime you cross the state line, federal law is always involved. So warehouses are expensive buildings to keep and maintain. And rather than going through the expense of building a nationwide network of warehouses, many wholesalers will contract with third party logistic companies. Uh, you will see these abbreviated frequently as 3PL and may provide all warehouse and transportation services or just one of the two components. So maybe they own the warehouse, but uh, the wholesaler would then have its entire transportation service uh, on their own, or maybe they have one th third party logistics company handling the warehouse and then another one handles the transportation. Uh, both are entirely possible. Um, I also have seen wholesalers in practice where uh, they have uh, a third party logistics company handling their warehouse and then they have common carriers. We haven't talked about those in this video and I don't think I have a slide for it, but there are some common carriers where there is a um, shipment process where they can ship it overnight or uh, ship it via express mail. Um, so those are done. And then recently a new type of third party logistics company has also recently popped up and these are for fulfillment pharmacies which handle the prescription fulfillment for e-commerce platforms. So you probably have seen commercials for companies like uh, Roe or Hims or HERS. Uh, you would see these companies and they actually contract with a pharmacy. So they provide the telehealth services, they contract with doctors in order to get somebody who's willing to see their patients and then they are basically the telehealth platform. And then the pharmacy gets an electronic copy of that prescription as a result of that visit. And that is how those prescriptions are filled. These companies um, will maintain licensure in all 50 states because that is expensive. So having a fulfillment pharmacy is very important to these organizations because without it, they would not be able to uh, provide their services because it would just be cost prohibitive to register with 50 different state boards of pharmacy and then also require your pharmacist in charge to do the same thing. And last piece of this inventory supply chain are the pharmacies themselves and they receive inventory from one or more drug wholesalers. Uh, you process the prescriptions, sell the final prescription to the patient. Pharmacies are generally registered with the Drug Enforcement Administration and one or more state boards of pharmacy. It is very important to note that pharmacy uh, pharmacists in charge uh, does have to register with every state that they are licensed to distribute medication in. So not only is your PIC uh, licensed with each individual state, but they, the pharmacy itself would also be. Uh, some pharmacies act as outsourcing facilities for hospitals and medical clinics. These pharmacies are generally compounding pharmacies. They must register with the FDA and must follow all FDA good manufacturing practices. And trust me, they are very rigid when it comes to um, this.
And then the last little bit, and we'll talk about these guys more in our third video in this series, and when all goes wrong and a drug expires on the shelf, we have at our disposal an entity called a reverse distributor. This entity takes medications that are expired or about to expire and collects the medication for disposal, and then they process the, they charge the manufacturer back for the unsold product, and then they credit the pharmacy in the form of a check. Uh, don't expect to get a lot of money though, because they don't usually collect a whole heck of a lot. We, we probably made pennies on the dollar for our expired medications. So let's do a couple of little knowledge checks. Uh, we're just at that point where we're going to talk about um, something else. So let's check our knowledge right now. So the role of the wholesaler is to A, research new medication, B, place medications into unit dose packages, C, distribute medications to pharmacies, or D, sell this medication directly to consumers. All right, so if you didn't guess that, the correct answer is C, they distribute medications to pharmacies. Wholesalers are responsible for taking medications received from manufacturers and packagers and selling them directly to pharmacies. With that, let's take a look at our next knowledge check. The entity that is dispensing a prescription to the patient is a drug manufacturer, pharmacy, wholesaler, or contract packager. If you answered B, pharmacy, that is correct. Pharmacies are tasked with dispensing prescriptions. Now we're gonna move on to the three regulatory agencies that are tasked with managing the drug supply chain in the United States. These are the State Boards of Pharmacy, the Food and Drug Administration, and the Drug Enforcement Administration. You may see these on the pharmacy technician certification exams in abbreviated names such as the BOP, FDA, and DEA respectively. And I will actually show you an example of what a question of that nature might look like. The first agency that we will discuss is the State Boards of Pharmacy. And these are the licensing agency generally tasked with enforcing the pharmacy laws of each of the individual states. These boards generally license pharmacies, pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, and wholesalers. Some states will also register the prescribers of controlled substances as well, since this agency is also tasked with regulating controlled substances within the states. These boards will also issue regulations to enforce the laws passed by the state legislatures. This agency is also responsible for inspecting pharmacies and wholesalers to ensure that all laws are being followed. Boards of pharmacy discipline licensees for violations of various laws and regulations, and if a board requires judicial opinions on a law, they will generally consult an administrative law judge in their state. This judge will issue an opinion called a finding of law, which is presented to the board for action for or against the licensee. The next agency is going to be the Food and Drug Administration, also known by its acronym, the FDA, as you see in this image right here. Um, they do share an office building with the Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Public Health Service. The FDA is charged with making sure the drug supply chain is safe, effective, and secure. To distribute a drug in the United States, a pharmaceutical manufacturer will need to get approval for a drug from the FDA. The FDA determines that the drug supply is safe and efficacious. That means the manufacturer is required to provide proof that the benefit of a medication outweighs its risks because every drug does have side effects. We are going to try to mitigate those as much as we possibly can. And that the medication is effective against a particular disease or a set of diseases. There is more to the FDA that we won't touch on in this video, so stay tuned for future law episodes of Drug School where we will investigate this 
agency in more detail. The third and final agency that we will talk about here is the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA, and that is charged with regulating controlled substances. The DEA is a sub-agency of the Department of Justice, and as the picture denotes, has agents that investigate drug crimes. We will discuss them more in depth in our law presentations. The DEA has three charges as far as the drug supply chain goes. The first charge is to schedule drugs that have demonstrated a risk of diversion or misuse. This means that the drug can be used for a non-medical purpose. The DEA can do this during the drug approval process by rulemaking through its powers under the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 or through an act of Congress such as the Anabolic Steroid Act of 1990 when Congress scheduled testosterone as a Schedule III controlled substance. The second charge of the DEA is to regulate the supply chain of controlled substances. This is supposed to reduce diversion by limiting the annual supplies of controlled substances that are brought into this country. Rarely works in practice, and if you've been in a pharmacy in the last year or two, you've seen its consequences with the various drug shortages, especially in controlled substance land that we've been experiencing. And this can cause those drug shortages if a quota is not correctly predicted. The third charge of the DEA is to enforce drug laws. This is done by registering pharmacies, wholesalers, prescribers, and reverse distributors. Yes, that is four different entities that they touch. Um, there are several other entities and regulatory agencies that affect pharmacy. We won't get them in, into them in this video because they really don't touch the supply chain itself. The DEA work also works in conjunction with uh, CBP or Customs and Border Protection to protect, or to protect against illegal importation of controlled substances. If any DEA registrant is found to be breaking the law by doing uh, any illegal importation or by selling a substance that they are not registered for, um, the DEA can exercise any available enforcement action against the registrant. And we will talk a lot more about them in our law videos because there, there is a lot more that goes on at the DEA than we can uh, talk about in this video. So let's talk about a little knowledge check. So which of the following regulatory agencies is responsible for maintaining a schedule of controlled substances? A, the FDA, B, the DEA, C, the CMS, and D is the FBI. If you answered the DEA, you are correct. While it is true that the FDA has some information about diversion and dependence in its labeling, the DEA is responsible for scheduling drugs on its list of controlled substances. CMS is the Center of Medicaid and Medicare Services, which is more of an agency that monitors uh, for insurance fraud. Uh, that is their predominant uh, law enforcement action. And the FBI, well, the FBI is actually the head agency that oversees the DEA. Um, so typically, there would be some truth in saying that the FBI um, maintains the schedule of controlled substances, but really that is actually from the DEA that that information comes from. So let's talk about the delivery sequence. And um, I'm going to actually cause a split in here. However, uh, the software I make these slides with does not allow me to create this split. So um, typically what you would see is an API manufacturer is the, is the manufacturer that makes the active pharmaceutical ingredient for a manufacturer. Uh, so the API manufacturer uh, can also send this information or send their products directly over to the pharmacy itself um, if they are a compounding pharmacy. So sometimes you might see that little short circuit here that doesn't go through these other two steps. Um, the manufacturer might uh, directly ship some of its products directly to a pharmacy. You'll typically see that in the specialty phase uh, space uh, where we used to have to order, especially some of our, our fertility medications would have to come directly from the manufacturer rather than from um, the wholesaler, which would be the next step in the chain. And then finally, it makes it to the pharmacy. Uh, the third video is actually going to go through the rest of this life cycle uh, about what happens when it gets 
uh, to the stage where it either is expired or unsaleable. And then we will deal with uh, some of the processes that go around inside of this space uh, when it's either unsaleable due to a recall or if it's unsaleable due to uh, it being expired or maybe it's arrived to your pharmacy damaged. Well, we will deal with all of those in our second and third videos, and we hope that you come uh, back to watch those as soon as they're produced. Should be coming out here in the next couple of weeks. If you have questions, please leave a comment uh, on this video. Uh, the more the merrier. I welcome all questions, and you can visit mydrugschool.com for more content. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you again soon.